Today's episode of Still Entitled is made possible with support from Widex, a global leader in premium hearing aid technology. Widex offers sophisticated hearing technology to meet all budgets and lifestyle needs. In fact, their latest Evoke hearing aid tech connects to most modern media devices for wireless streaming of phone calls, music, and of course, podcasts like Still Entitled right into your hearing aids. You may not know it, but Adam himself uses the latest Widex model called Evoke and he listed it as one of his top tech items of 2018. Today's hearing aids are truly at the front line of innovation. If you, a family member, or a friend are experiencing hearing loss, getting tested and treated now is the best course of action. Widex wants to give you, our listeners, the opportunity to try their hearing aids for yourselves with no obligation to purchase. Simply go to widex.com slash tested, that's W-I-D-E-X dot com slash tested, to learn where you can trial Widex hearing aids near you. Now on with the show. Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, lads. Ooh, welcome back to San Francisco. Thank yeah. you. This is, uh, is this def- going to go up next week? It's going up like today. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. right. It's Tuesday. Yeah. It's, yeah. Sorry it's we're late, everybody. <laughs> Sorry we're late. We, uh, we were in New York City's Comic Con, and I only got back last night. Boy, are your I, arms tired. I had a meeting in Seattle yesterday morning. Wow. Yeah, that's cross country. Yeah, um, I actually had a lovely meeting with uh, with uh, with uh, some new friends that we may be collaborating with on testing. Uh, and <laughs> wow, I went to Neil. St- I got to see some cool things Neil Stevenson is working on. I'm I'm always down to hear about cool things Neil Stevenson's working on. <laughs> Are they swords or books or uh, books about swords? No, it's neither of those. Uh, the project that he was playing with is BattleBots oriented. Oh, um, robot swords. Ro- yeah. <laughs> I feel there were like blades. There yeah. was destruction. Mm. I actually, yeah, it was like a busman's holiday. It was a lot of fun. Nice. Wait, what's a busman's holiday? Busman's holiday is that the bus, the guy who drives the bus, takes the bus on his holiday. Really? It's, well, no, it's a joke. It's a, it's an oh. old British phrase. It's like. Um, that like when the bus when the bus driver wants to take a vacation, he's got to take the bus somewhere. So it's not really a vacation because he's on the bus. So <laughs> it's like if I, the wow. Mythbusters, goes on a vacation and someone says, hey, do you want to push the detonator for this thing to make this thing get destroyed? And I do. It kind of feels like on my vacation, I'm doing my job. You're doing your thing. Not yeah. that I mind that because I always love pushing the button and destroying something. And, and some people like love driving best. buses. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. That was yeah, a, I learned. a lot of information that didn't actually yield a lot of information. I mean, New fr- I, it's not often you get a new phrase, so there you go. New York City. Yes, yeah, a, dude. Yeah, it's that pretty, was a, that was a really really fun. Did you get to go? Yes. Oh, I didn't know. New York City Comic Con. Nice. Um, this is our third or fourth year. Oh, that's a really good question. I think fourth. Okay, I mean, you may have um, missed one in there somewhere, right? No, I, I, you, better, sounds you right. didn't go when I still worked here. No, yeah. so maybe third. Yeah, it might anyway, be third. At regardless. any rate. One of the nice things that's happening with New York City Comic Con is that it's starting to take over Midtown New York in the same way that San Diego Comic Con takes over the gas lamp district of San Diego. There's a lot more Midtown New York than there is gas lamp district. Oh, there of San certainly Diego, is. Though. But the fact was was that uh, as I was riding my one wheel around, oh yeah, I meant to mention you took your one wheel to New I York. I did Comic-Con. not one wheel. The lovely folks at One Wheel sent me a loner. <sighs> It's a concierge <laughs> service. You get off the plane, someone's like, here's your one wheel to get around New York. This is specifically you, you, because of our long-standing relationship. Yes. You live a really blessed life. I, you realize that, totally, right? No, I pinch myself every okay. damn day. Oh, oh, you're going to be in New York this week. Oh, let's, well, you know. Hey, I hey, asked. Let's, I asked. Okay. Also, let's okay. be clear, because there are a bunch of articles that just came out over the weekend about the people who are doing like the Uber for the skies, doing helicopters yeah, from, yeah. from Midtown to JFK in six minutes, but it's $200 each way. And also, it goes like eighty like gallons per you know per hour. Right. Of, right? Yeah. Like the one wheel is the smarter way to get oh. around New York than if if you're frustrated by cars. Well, also, well, to be clear, I was staying on uh, I was staying in Times Square. Yeah. And Comic Con, so that's like basically Forty Second and Broadway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Comic Con in New York happens at the Javits Center, which is Eleventh Avenue and Thirty Fourth Street, give or take. Um, which is a you can make it on the one wheel in about. Five, seven minutes. Yeah, it's incredible. On, in a taxi cab or in any other conveyance besides a bicycle, it's 30 minutes to an hour. Yeah, to make I, that I've, same wa- trip. I've made that walk before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's so for, for our team, it was actually really helpful because I could make it to more things with more downtime in between to kind of wrap my head around the next thing that I was doing. Uh, so the one wheel became invaluable. 
Um, but as I was riding through Times Square, I was just constantly being high fived and said hello to by Comic Con attendees oh, through nice. all of Times Square, which is really really fun. Now, do you think those people thought you were an Adam Savage cosplayer, <laughs> or do you think they thought? Do you think they made? No, the, no, no, okay. no. They would say, "Hey, Adam." Okay. Um, and then uh, I I enjoyed a a really unique and singular experience on the one wheel, which was I went to dinner on Thursday night. With Molly Jong Fast. Okay. Uh, one of my favorite people on Twitter. She's awesome, outspoken, uh, and really super funny. We had a great dinner, and I, I rode my one wheel at dinner, uh, and we were on the Upper East Side. And so to get back to Times Square, I went through Central Park. And this main loop road of Central Park is closed. Uh, I think it's closed all the time. It might just be at night. I'm not actually sure. I think sure. it's closed all the time now, yeah. Well, I circumnavigated the entirety of Central Park in the dark <laughs> alone. I mean, I didn't see another human does your, being. Does the one wheel have a little light on the front? It does. Yes. Okay. And also, um, this was after a very rainy Yeah, uh, so I'm going to show you this, Will. And so the fans don't get pissed off. Um, we will post this video. Yeah, it'll uh, probably be up um, on your social media. It's going to be take, on the gram. Take a look at this. Yeah. <sighs> and so it's like right after, it wasn't raining as you were riding. <sighs> but it, it rained just before. And it was like a movie set, and it was yes. like 40 minutes of silence well, through and, Central and Park. And just those those like windy paved roads yeah. in Central Park with no yeah. people on them really? would be I mean, the best for that kind of... So like, yeah. incredible. And because it was raining, just not another human being in yeah. sight for 40 minutes. It was transformative. Oh, that's so fun. I was also brought right back to my original days in New York. So that's the first place I lived as an adult. In 1985, I moved to NYU downtown uh, and pretended to go to school for six months. <laughs> but I spent from 1985 to 1990 bombing on a bicycle through the streets of New York and Brooklyn, probably 10 or 15 miles a day for five years. Yeah, mm. And there's a way in which riding the one wheel put me, slotted me right back into that 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 bicycle trap riding among traffic kind of mindset. And it was intoxicating for me. It was lovely. It was like going 30 years, taking a time machine back. When you go to New York, do you ever want to move back? Does it ever, do you ever do you get I those feels? I don't. I'm I, always I'm always intrigued by it whenever when I'm there. Um, so I lived there. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends there. I will tell you, um, like even the rich people I know in New York, <laughs> it's hard to get a lot of light into your house. Well, that's it's a vertical city, yeah. and so I feel like very. It's very clear to me that in California, uh, I get a lot more uh, bang for my buck in, in the housing situation and living in a place that feels like an oasis, that feels like mine. Uh, my house would be absolutely unaffordable uh, in New York New City. York. Okay, you know, a freestanding. Edwardian, <laughs> it would be insane. It's yeah, a, young, a younger person live, city. You'd live far away. Yeah, yeah. Like all uh, the benefits of all the, the social, the nightlife, and stuff. That's yeah. that's that's for people in their twenties. And, and you think yeah, so? I, 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 there's a pacing that I, I'm not looking for a busier city than San Francisco at this point. Well, that's fair. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, we're already considering quieter futures. Uh, so I am not drawn to move back to New York, even though I still think of myself as a New Yorker 30 years after I moved to San Francisco. Uh, I'm, I'm not itching to move back. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was so, yeah. just my one wheel adventures. Yeah. Uh, but, then uh, we, before even going to New York Comic Con, we hit two places. One was the Met. Dude. Dude. Uh, so... <laughs> uh, in 1981, when I saw Excalibur with mm -hmm. my dad and said I became obsessed with armor, my dad was like, well, we should go see the armor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I'm like, suddenly museums are interesting to me. <laughs> are you serious, father? They have armor there. And he's like, yeah, they have a room with armor. And I didn't, I didn't know what I pictured. But if you walk into the armor room at the Met and you see those four mounted on horseback knights with mount with horses also wearing armor wow. in the center of the room. I walked into that room at 14 and that started a lifelong love affair with armor. Wow. Uh, that, is, that image has burned my brain because it was the book cover from that classic 1960s mm -hmm. book from the mixed yep. up files of Miss Basilie Frankweiler. Oh, right. And, yes. and it is. That oh. armor room. Every kid read this. Wait, is it, that the book about the kids that li live in the museum yes. for the summer? Yeah, and they find like the Michelangelo and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that that book cover is that those four. And so that's nights. me wow. at fourteen seeing that room. Yeah, and uh, we we reached out to the Met because they have an exhibit that is going up this week called "The Last Night," and it is a a a, a glimpse into 
the history of the art and artifice and uh, and craftsmanship of armor through the lens of Emperor Maximilian, the last Holy Roman okay. Emperor, uh, who was also, I think, the last uh, emperor to go to battle on foot in armor. Is Holy Roman what became Austrian Hungary? I think after that, or so. is that the I mean, Turkish European Ottoman side? History is really foggy. okay. Yeah, yeah. Six months of pretending to be at college. Exactly. I got uh, yeah, and there was no liberal arts requirement at Tisch. <laughs> Yeah, of course. So I'm totally stupid. But uh, the last night, the exhibit, the last night, is a masterpiece. Pierre Targenian, the the curator uh, at the Met, the armor curator, um, and I are almost the same exact age. So he had the same kind of uh, connection with Excalibur, uh, and we had a lovely tour. We shot a, oh, a delightful awesome. tour of tested through the collection. There's a whole room. First of all, you walk in and there's a horse, a mounted horse. Uh, in armor, and it's not horse armor like any I had seen before. And I mentioned what I thought was unique about it, and Pierre said, absolutely, that is actually quite unique. I hadn't seen another like this. Was horse armor a thing that was the actually, like, how much was the stuff that was actually used versus stuff that was just ceremonial and pretty? Uh, all of the armor in this exhibit was used. Okay. Uh, there's a few pieces that were ceremonial or that were unfinished, but all of Emperor Maximilian's armor, I kept on looking at pieces and going, well, certainly that was ceremonial. And he said, nope, he went into battle in this. So like a you could see rubies. the swords wow. has the scratches on it, like these giant broadswords. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, there's an entire room in the exhibit of children's armor. Yeah. Well, of course, the kids got to have armor too. Uh, and there's a pair of gauntlets uh, towards the end that are so surpassingly beautiful. Melissa Ang, I think, will go and spend several days in a row staring at these gauntlets. Uh, lime cluster to to for research, and I know that she's actually based some of her designs on Maximilian armor designs. Mm -hmm. She's very familiar with this armor. Uh, it's a beautiful exhibit, and having visited a bunch of different armor collections, um, I still not yet been to the Royal Armory at Leeds. That's the next thing I'm going to do the next time I'm in England. Um, this is a truly great show and it's really unique. There are some pieces in this show that have never been to, or that haven't been together in hundreds of years. And this is a traveling show or is this just at the Met? I think it's just at the Met. Oh, wow. Okay. There's, and there's also three breastplates in there that actually when hit by a lance would send a shield flying. Yeah. So it's, it's under breastplate. So there's a breastplate that you has a mechanism with wheels that then you mount a like a protective shield so on it's top. like reactive you mount, you, armor you mount your you mount your, uh, oh, your, your shield your jousting yeah, yes, yes. shield on top of that and if you get hit and it gets a pressure backwards the clockwork mechanism on the breastplate sends your shield up. Shine, wow. flying high so clearly jousting was like pro wrestling <laughs> Right, oh, it was. You mean it was all a work? Well, it was. It was. There was stuff being done just for the crowds to be able to see and understand things better. Wow. Right. It was like not to say that they were faking it, but they were doing it for the entertainment value. That is fascinating. Yeah, it's truly fascinating. There's horse armor in which the horse couldn't see, because if they could see someone riding towards them, they wouldn't have ridden. Well, there's. So I mean, you horses, trained a horse to run blind. I mean, a lot of a lot of horse stuff is designed to keep the horse from having the appropriate inputs to have a smart decision. <laughs> For the horse. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. there's a reason when they're in racers, they always have blinders on it so they can't see the horses on their periphery because they'll swerve away. There was um there was a couple of moments while we were walking through and we captured them on video where I would make a commentary about an armor and I'd say, This is a really interesting piece to me because from what I've seen, I haven't seen something like this. And Pierre was very gracious. I don't know whether he's just being overly complimentary or whether he was telling the truth, but he was like, Oh, your your experience with armor and the history of armor really shows and you're right about that because and i was feeling all like oh, flattered really nice. <laughs> yeah I mean, it's always it lovely awesome. to find out when well i mean because it's not like you've been formally trained in this stuff no this is i just am years a serial and years of dilettante yeah. so to find out that i actually have joined i gathered some expertise is always fascinating <laughs> to me <laughs> well, like that's be, awesome beyond this looks good and that looks good it sounds so that sounds it sounds wonderful and there's gonna be a video yes there's yes. gonna be a video yep. and it's not the last time you're gonna visit the mets collection okay uh they they were fabulous to deal with um i we're really having a great time visiting these big museum institutions oh, i i love going like just going to museums where and talking to the people who are the most passionate like if you're talking to somebody who's passionate enough about a topic to devote their entire life to it you're going to have a fascinating conversation with them and well, if they have props all the better. Most all of the time I say yes. I have had the opposite experience a couple of times, but it, they are the way outliers. Yeah. I've had, yeah, I've had experts totally crap on me. Well, I mean, it can <laughs> look, happen. there's jerks in every field. <laughs> 
the distribution of idiots is equivalent across yeah. every field. Yeah. It turns out. Uh, so what else What else happened in New York? And then Anybody went to exciting? New Jersey, went over to oh, North yeah. Bergen High School. Okay. Oh, I'm, yes. I'm familiar with North Bergen High School. Yeah. I've seen some of their work behind me, I think, right now. You are. Yeah, yes. behind The you. alien spacesuit behind yeah. us is their beautiful <laughs> handiwork. Uh, the students of North Bergen, under the tutelage and guidance of Stephen DeFendini, uh, it's a it, it's amazing what they're doing, and they were all making Comic Con costumes when we were there. Nice, yeah. So they were nice. building. They, yeah, we could did we covered their builds <laughs> on a on a video walking through and got to see some of the original alien set parts. They built an engineer, kind of in one to one scale. Yeah, an the, engineer, the, like seated engineer. Engine? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. The, 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 yes. the, the, out of like paper mache or something? Yeah, paper mache and pool noodles and wood. And like they built pool it noodles. and it was huge and they looked at it and they were like, it's not big enough. And they literally doubled its size. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so has that has that whole thing, I mean, they got a ton of press for that. Has that started a movement in theater departments where they're doing like adaptations of more modern stuff? I have of- not heard tell of that. And frankly, if you, if you out there listening to this know about other theater departments that are taking North Bergen High School's example and running with it, we would really really like to know. Um, personally, I'd love to lend expertise and uh, and information to people interested in doing this space, not like I've got a ton, a ton of time to come visit. However, I think that there is meat in potentially a tested series of visiting schools doing this kind of thing. Well, it, it also fits right into my ethos of educating kids about what fair use really means because North Bergen high school, when Stephen DeFendini, and I said this on the podcast before, but when Stephen first got his call from Ridley Scott's office, he thought he was going to be chewed out. Yeah. He was terrified. And the fact is he shouldn't have been, and he had no reason to be what that high school did was absolutely a transformative work of art that falls deeply in the red hot beating center of fair use. Mm -hmm. And, it's great for us to culturally know what that means and how much latitude one can have within that space because we should like to, these kids learned a tremendous amount by recapitulating this amazing piece of culture. I mean, that, that's the thing. One of the ways that you can understand both the making side and, and the cultural impact side of something is by recreating it. I mean, you've talked about that a ton. We've talked about how we prop, get things prop out of our system that way. Yeah, well, yeah. And how, how prop making departments are a hotbed of learning how to do a ton with very, very little. Absolutely. And, and like, but, but, but the mere act of, like, a few months ago, I reshot a scene from Toy Story just f- using the animation stuff that we build just as an exercise internally so we could see, like, where we were doing stuff right and where we were doing stuff wrong. Mm-hmm. And as a result of reshooting the You're Just a Toy scene from Toy Story, you know, you, you are a toy when, yeah. when Woody yells at Buzz at, yeah. outside the gas station. Like, it made me appreciate every single aspect of that scene so much more because we'd taken the, the effort of going through and, and, and doing this thing. Absolutely. There's, there, there are few greater exercises than copying as a way of educating the interstices of a work. And Mary Carr, who wrote Liars Club and Lit and a bunch of other wonderful things, talked about, um, talked about what she does when she has writer's block. She was asked about that. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, I don't really like the term writer's block, but I'll tell you when when the my work isn't flowing, I sit at my desk and I copy the work of writers I love in longhand. Hmm. She said, my fidelity at the desk is to write. And when I write out the work of people who admire writing that I love that's important to me, I actually, I do start to understand things about it that I don't get just from reading it. Uh, and that's real. And, and I think that's, a, I, I like to joke that it took me five years of making sculptures that were kind of ripoffs of Giger's work in order to get Giger into my system enough to know what I needed and get the rest out of it. <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I'm not interested in the sexual aspect of his work, even though I admire and think it's amazing. I am interested in the biomechanical aspect and the ways in which its creepiness informs a kind of a, a deep set evolutionary fear. I find that really fascinating. And I had to just make a ton of sculptures that sort of mirrored his aesthetic in order to understand what I wanted out of it. So again, yeah, I just think it's a fantastic that's lesson. That's so cool. That's, that's that uh, Stephen and with the su- full support of his high school. You know, I met a whole bunch of the faculty, and I mean, they're all just tickled pink I, about the attention. I mean, I have to imagine Alien. Alien's an edgy choice for a high school production. I have to imagine. I agree. They yeah. had blood spraying on a high school yeah. stage. That's 
That's really cool. That's the, the, what is the other one? Agnes of God, right? Well, like, like that's that, <laughs> that would like, be another really. Yeah. If I mean, if you think about it, though, would Alien be an R-rated movie today? Oh yeah. You think? Absolutely. With chestburster? Blood, Come on. Yeah. Chestburster? I guess. I mean, I guess. I, I guess what I'm saying You're is, thinking that television has far more latitude than I, movies. But I'm, right? I'm not. I'm not thinking about. I'm not thinking about the movie as shot. I'm thinking if they made Alien today, it would be PG-13, and they would cut away from the chestburster at the last minute before the oh. gore bursts out, and like there'd be two cuts, and it would be a PG-13 movie. It would make way more money. Uh, <laughs> you know, there'd be there'd also be a lot less blood. Yeah, they, they, they definitely cut blood way down on the PG-13 yeah. ratings. Um, and I think that would be a disservice. It's actually, well, I, I'm not advocating yeah, no, no, releasing no, no, a PG-13 no. version um, of it. But I, I do find it funny when I, I've been recently watching some movies from the 80s, like I watched Roadhouse. Yeah. And I think it's hilarious when you watch a hard R from the 80s, it announces that it's a hard R within the first three lines of dialogue. Someone drops F-bombs like buying a cup of coffee. Well, that and even like PG-13 movies from the early 80s before PG-13 came on are really, really a lot. <laughs> like you have to be careful with a with a, like a 1982 PG. Oh, really? Yeah, like I sat down. We were gonna watch. I, I mean, like Indian Raiders of the Lost Ark is a PG. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Melting Temple Face. Wow. Of, Temple of Doom is maybe the first PG 13, or maybe it was oh, the last yeah. right, PG right. before they added PG 13. Before they realized they needed some before, new layer. Yeah, before they were like, oh man, maybe seven year olds maybe and pulling 15 the hearts year olds. out of people on yeah. live. Is, yeah, maybe that's Tell a problem. Yeah. Um, so that was all before Comic Con. I know. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was funny. You mentioned the blood. We were sitting backstage because we did a lot of this, uh, interview stuff on the actual stage, oh, and the school cool. was like in session, right? Like behind right. the curtain was closed, and there was like some class happening in the, the gym. Or there in, in there the is a hilarious moment when you're in a school, in a high school, and the bell rings, Brrr, bing, 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 and you hear everyone pile out of the classrooms. That it it, it elicits this. You feel like you oh, have to move. This old feeling yes. in you. Yeah, and the smells, of everything. Stress, right? Yes, oh, Those stress hormones everywhere <laughs> never goes away. Right, uh, but on the wall, like um, by the side of the stage, they had the test blood splatters still on the wall. Oh wow! Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, like, that's awesome. Yeah, it was great. That's so um, cool. Super inspiring. And the kids, it was great to meet the kids. I had met Steven at my book signing at Barnes & Noble in May. Uh, it was fabulous to meet the kids. That's Especially so cool. the young actress that played uh, Ripley, uh, who got a scholarship from Ridley Scott to attend the, cons the, the acting conservatory in New York City. Oh, that's so uh, good. She started like three weeks ago. Oh, that's awesome. She was on stage at Comic-Con being interviewed uh, for a Le Legion M's film. Uh, it was just great. That's so rad. Yeah. That's so good. And then we hit Comic-Con, and uh, you did... Two incognitos. I did two incognitos. I only knew about one of them. I, I, think. I did a quiet one yes. with my friend Sasha. Oh, yeah. uh, she wanted to. Uh, she wanted to try out cosplay, and she went as a uh, an early Jerry Anderson uh, uh, character whose name escapes me right now because. It's one of the Thunderbirds. Just, what's right? that? It's one of the Thunderbirds. It's not one of the Thunderbirds. Oh, it's okay. actually a different Jerry Anderson show than Thunderbirds. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, and she went through the whole process of doing cosplay from like hand making the tunic and adding the buttons and lit shoulders, uh, uh, epaulets and a helmet with warbler and trying multiple iterations. Uh, uh, Sasha Judd, actually, she, uh, she did a wonderful tweet thread about the build process that I retweeted a couple of days ago. Um, and so I simply brought a casual walk around costume to walk with her across the floor. And oh, I think awesome. it was, um, I did Moonwatcher's face okay. with uh, Jack Aubrey's uniform from Master and Commander. So oh. I guess I was the educated ape. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that was That's the right awesome. day to do it because then it was packed the rest of the days. Uh, no Face, of course, was the big costume you've been working on for that weeks. We had alluded to it many times on this podcast. And do you it, know that we, we, we put up on Twitter? A photograph of I workshopped No Face's jaw mechanism in foam core before I built it in aluminum, and then I had to build it three more to two more times in aluminum. But the once I made the foam core mock up and I saw that I had the right size, I then cut it all apart and threw it on the ground, and we took a picture of the detritus. And somebody sussed it out. Someone guessed it within ten minutes. Oh, well, that could be mouth mechanics for no face. And that would explain that bucket of uh, teeth made of chopping block material that I saw last week. Oh, yeah. Crazy. Wow. You can't hide a thing from They Sherlock Holmes did. Yeah. They got right down it, to it. It's, it's really, That's I was amazing. almost annoyed. But <laughs> I mean, really, more than that, I'm thrilled and astounded. It's a problem with having a smart audience and fan base. <laughs> totally true. Yeah. Um, the no face, the no face uh, walk was a unique one because it was highly performative. 
usually I'm walking and sometimes talking to people, Judge Dredd, you know, like that. And a Joker, you know, you move in a Joker way. And there's a lot of different aspects to it. But No Face at this point in the movie, he is desperate and yelling. So I hit the floor. I had a little microphone with a nice loudspeaker mounted to my back. And I did that because I wanted the voice to be slightly disembodied. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to not quite feel like it was connected. And then I just wandered the floor yelling, Zed, where are you, Zed? What have you done to me? I'm hungry. You better bring me some food. Uh, yeah. And I just did that for 45 minutes. Did you, um, did, have you, has the video gone up yet? It'll go up tomorrow. Oh, well, I don't want to spoil it, but there was a part of that costume that is my absolute favorite that I think was like, oh, no, you can spoil it. Go ahead. Okay. So the food, yeah, the food that, that Jen and Mel oh my made gosh. They, is like, the costume's great. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Yada, yada. The food is exceptional. Yeah. It's so good. It's I basically showed them, uh, I, sh I, uh, I had sent them to purchase some foam from a mattress supplier and the mattress supplier said, well, you don't need to purchase it. You could just pull all this open cell foam out of our dumpster that we don't need. So they came back with like a car full of foam and I showed them how to cut open cell urethane foam on a bandsaw mm -hmm. and shape it on a belt sander and do final shaping. And I like unleashed, I, I unleashed a new version of <laughs> Mel and Jen because like I just said, you know, make a couple things each and they made me like, a dozen objects, oh. birthday cake, fish with one eye and human teeth, terrifying nightmare fuel, it was beautiful gorgeous. toy. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we have pictures that, of all yes, that yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll that'll cut into the video, hopefully. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. And so we actually brought that stuff with us and we were giving it to people to feed me on the floor. And so then I would eat it and I'd pull it from behind and then I'd poop it right back out. I yeah, didn't yeah. have a sat, sack underneath. Um, and we even tried to give some of the pieces of food to children to feed to me and no child wanted anything to do I, with I, no face. I can't imagine. <laughs> like, I, honestly, when we tried to watch, we still haven't gotten all the way through Spirited Away with my daughter because she's scared of no face. Yeah. Um, no face is a scary character. Did you, head out the, did you do the coins? No, yeah. I didn't do the coins because that wasn't that part of the I movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to keep to it. Uh, it was very hilarious to scare children um <laughs> it's the it's the anti-baymax costume um yeah, not huggable at all no it was so you get all the way inside a build like this and you don't have a real clear idea of what its affect is going mm -hmm. to be and i walk out of our new york comic-con is great about giving us a room for our base of operations oh, that's wonderful storing our camera Holy equipment cow. and everything uh and we were able to lock it it was great uh, so we got dressed in there and then I walk out and you're in the hallway with all the other rooms with other people who are backstage at the con. John Krasinski walked past a couple of times. We saw the cast of The Expanse again. Those guys are lovely. And so I walk out in the hallway and this is the group of like, this is the two cool for school group, right? They're yeah. all the talent that are the reason people are showing up. And I walk out in the no face costume and I can hear, oh, mm, and, you know, a little bit of sounds. And then I open the mouth and I heard this whole hallway of people go, oh! And I was like, oh, this is going to go fun. This is going to be neat. Am I right? That yeah, sound and then, was... and then clapping. Gasp and then cheers. Yeah. That's it was so yeah, good. Really, really cool. The crushed velvet for the inside of the mouth lent that specular wet look that was really cool. The crushed velvet on the outside, which was slightly brown, made it really look kind of oily in a way that felt terrific. And honestly... If I was going to make this film, this costume for a live action film, there are a bunch of small things I might alter in terms of its internal structure. I might give it more of an internal structure that undulated or moved, but I could not be happier well, it, with the affect of this. Yeah, costume. like it seems like there's some stuff you could do at the mechanism that would make it more fiddly for for production, but for a walk, but acceptable for production. It was great. It yeah, was so, so cool. much fun. Uh, and one of my uh, more comfortable costumes. I didn't sweat balls in it. I mean, I certainly was got a little sweaty from the labor. Oh, and there was- Well, you were nude under there, so that helped <laughs> probably. I went command. Everyone should know that I'm not going to go commando underneath a costume at a con, <laughs> just so no one has to have that image in their head. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The- uh, um, What's your follow-up, Will? I got nothing now. I'm, I'm, I'm gone. You had a serious point. Uh, the cosplay walk was great, uh, and then we did um, we did we did a couple. We did several panels. Uh, you did, yeah. You you were at Anime Fest. You uh, had your own panel. Anime Fest was wonderful. Yeah. That was a great That's like a crowd. Sister, just yes. a bit that happened at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that was at the Hammerstein Ballroom, or no, the Hammerstein no, no, no. Ballroom. Was, that was your panel. That was I the, pan, the yes. great debate for sci-fi. Yes, yes. 
Um, that the, the the anime fest was really lovely, cool. uh, and the folks there were also great. But that's also Reed Pop, am I right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. So Anime Fest was a lovely crowd with some terrific questions. Mm. Uh, my mom and sister came to that and also to The Great Debate, which was the same night. Am I right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, the Great Debate panel out. was really, really fun. Uh, it was uh, beautifully moderated. It's always a wonderful cast of characters. This was an entirely new cast of characters except mm. for me, Oh, I think. Um, I got to sit next to Amber Ruffin who is one of the lead writers on Seth Meyers, Late Night with Seth oh, Meyers. Okay. I, and I'm a huge fan. Uh, and we exchanged information. I sent my information and she texted me yesterday, you fool, you've given me your personal information. Now I'm going to text you. And I was like, you know, by having my number, you get to call me from any writer's room to answer a question that is currently under debate. And she wrote back and said, that is so cute that you thought you had to say that out loud because I totally was going to do that anyway. Uh. <laughs> Um, what, what what was the food situation in New York? Did you do any any good meals, big meals? No, we stayed in New Jersey. Oh, <laughs> we stayed in Weehawken. Oh. Yeah, our team. So they we, have we food there too. Yeah, yeah, right. You stayed in Weehawken. Did you visit uh, the the Hamilton? No, dual we knew location? it was up the hill. What? I said everything's legal in Jersey. Yeah, but we did not have time. I know it was oh, it was a man. minor regret. If yes. only you had a one wheel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, the day after, you had uh, a series of interviews with some amazing cosplayers, oh some familiar God. friends of Tested. Yep. So Beverly so like Downen, Beverly Downen, and Downen Creative. Ang, yep, yep, and some uh, cosplayers we never met before, but uh, um, incredible work. I don't um, want to spoil too much of it, but there's a series of interviews coming. coming. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so uh, uh, Chris and Lobosny, part of our Tested team, curated this this group of cosplayers and each one bringing unbelievable skill and totally different approaches to some amazing costumes i saw some really nifty techniques for instance beverly downen did a hella costume she did hella without the headdress okay um you know i'm a reasonable person. casual hella <laughs> yes casual yeah. hella and perfect costume with uh silicon appliques over over the uh the cloth costume but then she had this extra layer of like a a, a pill pattern like a screen pattern on the fabric and i'm oh. not used to seeing this and i said is this a fabric you bought with this texture on she said no she used a cricket machine to cut out the pattern out of a semi-gloss iron-on applique. Wow, and then she lined it up? And then she lined it up before sewing the costume together and got this seriously like movie quality texture look to store-bought fabric for her helicopter. It's, it was mwah, This perfect. is how they do the latex. I mean, with the latex, they just print the... I mean, sorry, with the Lycra costumes, they print the patterns on the, on they the costume screen in advance, print the, screen print They in screen okay. print the patterns in a dimensional ink yeah. to give the Cordura pattern for like a Captain America costume. Okay. Um, yes. So this is... Uh, she, Beverly That's also, uh, somebody else that we talked to, uh, whose name escapes me right now because there was a bunch of folks, did um, this textured pattern on her helmet, on oh, this yes, gold yes, helmet. Yes, yes, Regan of uh, Cowboy Crunchies. Yes, yes. Okay. Regan was phenomenal. Uh, Regan and Scone were a couple. They cosplayed together as two different characters. And Regan's headdress. This is a Hella headdress? Or? No, 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 no. For a totally different character. Okay. Um, had layered te- layered textures. And what she'd done was she'd cut each layer out of like one millimeter sticky backed craft foam on the cricket. Oh. And then layered them over each other and then painted them gold. And it was. Uh, oh, like scales almost? Uh, or? Uh, I don't have the I, pictures. I have pictures. You yeah, do. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, we'll post pictures yeah, yeah, of this. Yeah. An incredible effect for wow. a very low cost, low impact uh, 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 creation. Oh my God, that's incredible. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Again, whenever you're covering these cosplayers, you're not, you're, everybody's finding their own way to these solutions and then they're sharing them. That's the thing that, that that's the thing that always struck me when we first started talking to cosplay. When we talked to Harrison, even like Harrison Cricks of uh, Vulpin mm-hmm. at the time was doing, I think, the best work out there, and pro- frankly, probably still is on the kind of stuff that he was focusing on. And he was just like, "Yeah, here are the plans for the." It took me three hundred hours to put together these Daft Punk helmets, but here's the wiring diagrams, and here's all the stuff, and you can just you know, well, go, if you want to make your own, go for it. And when I so uh, I did get to uh, I buried the lead because I got to go to the Saturday Night Live after party on Saturday <gasps> night. Oh wow! <laughs> well, the first thing I asked was I connected the dots. I heard about this yesterday. I was like, 
Effie Waller Bridge posted that night. <laughs> yes, she did. And 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 Tay Tay was the musical act. Yeah. Uh, I did not get to meet or see either of those Aww. insanely talented, awesome women. Um, but that is fine because I got to hang out with Louie, who's been a makeup supervisor for like over 20 years. I made some friends with other of the makeup people at oh, SNL awesome. uh, through uh, through some mutual friends. Awesome. Rick Baker and his family. Um, it was a magical night because I got to have dinner with Rick and Sylvia. And uh, oh, then I went to Travis McElroy's party and then I met up with them at the after party and uh, got to hear that like when 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 Don Cheadle was on SNL, they bought an Iron Man costume and it arrived and it was not as good as they were hoping. And so they downloaded plans for an Iron Man costume offline to build in craft foam and built it in two days flat. Oh my God. Wow. And that's because the cosplayers are sharing their, yeah. their data. Yeah. And you know, as I said this at my panel, um, 10 years ago, there was a vigorous debate on the online uh, maker community about what was craft and what was art. Yep, yep. And that debate is effectively gone. There's still some dumbasses doing gatekeeping within the cosplay community. And I'm referring to people who think of 3D printing as quote cheating. They can bite me. It's not cheating. And if you if you think well, it's cheating, you've clearly never worked with 3D prints to get certain effects because it can still be really hard I, work. I mean when we started when we started talking to you and we we're like hey we've, we've done some 3d printing stuff what do you think about it you're like yeah it's, it's neat but it's not good enough for what i'm doing and and then uh when we when we met sean and yep. he worked he on the, on the my mind about glove. what is possible yeah. he showed you what, what somebody who's really spent time and devoted effort to learning how to do it versus what norm and i were doing yeah um and it, it's it, yeah it's, it's just another tool it's so, all just another tool and i the generosity is something that just uh, it seeps through every pore of the cosplay community. And because especially since I spent the last weekend in San Diego at TwitchCon hosting the, the costume judging for that. And again, every one of these folks was super open with, you'd hold a sword and they would rapid fire download to you. Like mm -hmm. I made this thing in MDF and then I put it in this and then I put it in this and I put it in rubber and then this didn't act with that. So I had to redo this. And then I did this out of this kind of resin. And I found this kind of resin and then the lights work, but the lights didn't go out. So then I, I'm That's never so happier when I'm getting that like feverish download of all the pathways that got burned to get to the right solution. It was always one of the most fun parts of a tested event when people would come in costume and you could ask them how what they did it because well how that how they made it because the stories are always great and you always learn something new because somebody in their garage they like people are figuring out new stuff all the time totally and it's um, really really amazing. We got to do a, a, a tested repair desk again. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, that was really fun when we did that at Silicon Valley. Get, you should tw get Twitch to sponsor that and just stream it. That's a really good idea. <laughs> just cut this part out of the podcast. No, okay. back no and it's a public, public call for them. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. get in touch. Um, what am I forgetting about New York Comic Con? I got to see Tom Sachs and I got to visit his shop and uh -huh. see some of the things he was working on and see his team. And that was all delightful. Uh, I you don't know, think we're missing anything. That's yeah, that was that, that, that was, was a pretty, pretty, pretty big was weekend. Pretty my, packed. My, I got to see my mom. My mom was in San Francisco last weekend, and then I got to see her this weekend in New York. So super treat to see her on two different coasts, and also got to see Joey Famelli on yeah. two different coasts because he was here this morning. Oh, yeah. nice! Uh, for the podcast, we'll put up I think next, next week. week or the week yeah. after. Okay, awesome. Yeah. I guess that's as good a place to wrap it up as any. What's what's on the site this week, Norm? Uh, it's a lot of New York Comic Con stuff. Uh, the incognito video should be going up soon, and uh, those other videos, cosplay interviews, be rolling up after that. Um, we talked about on my other podcast, Brad and Will made a tech pod. Uh, we talked about uh, kitchen tech this week. So we talked Ooh. about emergent circulators, sous vide machines. We talked about instant pots. I'm still skeptical about air fryers, which just sound like tiny convection ovens. Yeah. Um, Everyone I know did, who has one loves it. Did I ever tell you the time when Tracy Desjardins' uh, hot water heater broke and she wanted to take a bath and she sent me a picture of... I think three jewel immersion circulators in her bathtub. I did that to heat up the swimming pool in the backyard this summer. <laughs> like we had a, we, it was when it was a hundred degrees out. Yeah. My wife went to Target and bought a nineteen dollar inflatable swimming pool. Yep. And I just jammed the jewel in it's there. A until massive, it was, it's yeah. a massive heating element. It's so, a huge so, yeah. so that blow mold, that roto molded like eight foot diameter swimming pool that you got at the toy store. I grew up having that yeah. every summer. We had one of those every summer. We, we had one when my daughter was young too. And, and I remember very specifically, I was probably like six years old. And we had this big, the house I grew up in was built on an, un, was on an unbroken acre lot. 
because okay. they, the neighborhood I, I grew up in was broken into acre lots in 1900 when it was built. And we had one of the few unbroken lots. So mm -hmm. we had this long yard. It was really amazing to grow up there. Anyway, we set this pool up and we're all like, it's a hot New York summer. We're all enjoying the pool. And my dad is like, everybody look out. We see him running from the other end of the yard and he's going to take a running jump into this <laughs> pool. And it's like in slow motion, he leaves the ground and flies through the air and puts his feet together and in a seated position, he smack lands in the bottom of the pool and promptly his feet travel right through the other side of the pool. <laughs> and the pool is effectively a hunk of plastic garbage at that point and all the water's gone and we've gone from the highest joy we can imagine seeing this incredible thing unfolding to all of us crying oh <laughs> we so those things were good for usually one year because yeah. they get crunchy after yeah, that totally or you turn them over and then the next year it's a spider paradise we oh. use them as sleds in the winter time oh. it, you were usually had like four maybe five good rides that's like an episode of jackass like the giant Shopping cart oh for Jackass too. I mean, they, we, our hills, we, our hills weren't that steep, but yeah, I mean, we, we had some fairly steep hills at the Rockefeller yeah, property. There was potential for harm for physical injury. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, you can find that at TechPod.Content.Town. All right, uh, and on that note, yeah, see you guys next week. I guess. Yeah. See you guys. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. See you have then. a good one. Bye, Bye guys. guys.